So tonight, we're going to continue the conversation from Sunday morning. We're going to kind of answer this question as to where Family Church is going. What are we doing? What are we about? What are we believing in? Uh, with that said, we are going to be throwing a celebration uh, the last Wednesday of the month for Pastor Kat and Pastor Bryant. Uh, what's that, the 29th? Uh, August 29th, we're going to be throwing a big party here, celebration, celebrating Pastor Cat and Pastor Bryant. Uh, Pastor Cat's favorite dessert is ice cream, and Pastor Bryant's favorite dessert is anything chocolate cake, cupcake, anything like that. So we're going to kind of have uh, a big ice cream sundae, chocolate cake celebration kind of thing uh, for them. All right? And so you know, that, that brings a question like, okay, so where are we going? What's this going to be like? What's, what's worship going to sound like? Different. Different. She's been leading worship for over 20-something years. So obviously, somebody's voice is going to sound different. All right? Um, I, will be, I will be taking the lead of the direction of worship. I will not be on stage singing worship. Um, my day has come and gone. You guys really don't want my Axl Rose worship. Um, that's how I lead worship, kind of screamo, heavy metal rock. Might not be a cultural fit for Family Church right at this time. But ultimately and spiritually, I want to give you some insight to where we're heading. All right? We believe that Family Church has a commission. We are commissioned to do something. And from the beginning of time, from Genesis to Revelation throughout the Bible, every time God was dealing with his people, he had four things that he constantly talked about. Four things, they were the pillars of building church. Now, when we talk about building church, we're not talking about this facility. We're not talking about these chairs and this building and this parking lot. We're talking about building the kingdom of God. And we are the church. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit and members in particular. We are the church. But the four pillars of the church are something that God talked about all the time. These are the four posts that hold this thing up. Four things. How many things? There's four things that God constantly talked about as the life cycle of the church. Four things that we're supposed to be doing. And the first one, anybody here on Sunday, what's the first thing? Not sure? Two of you? We're going to see the lost saved. God desires to see the lost saved. In fact, Saturday, I will be uh, preaching at a conference at Eddie Farms. If you guys are interested in going, check it out on their website. I'll be preaching at a conference there. And the, the topic that they want me to talk about is reaching the unchurched. Right, And so if you look at Jesus' teachings and look at him in Matthew 9, he says, I came here to save the lost. My whole mission, my whole purpose for coming to this earth was to save the lost. But we can't just leave people there. We can't leave people at just getting saved and say, okay, good luck, figure it out. Four things that God is always constantly wanting to see the church do. See the lost saved, see the saved, pastored, see the pastored, discipled, and see the discipled, sent or commissioned. Yes. The lost saved, the saved pastored, the pastored, discipled, the discipled, sent. And this is the life cycle of the church. This should be happening on a constant basis. This is our life cycle. The church should be doing this over and over and over again. The law saved, the saved pastored, the pastor discipled, and the disciples sent. The law saved, the saved pastored, the pastor discipled, and the disciple sent or commissioned. And we're talking about what are you commissioned to do? All right? Salvation gets people into heaven. A baby Christian can go to heaven, but someone who is far from God and has never heard the gospel cannot get into heaven. It has to start at salvation. The Bible tells us, how can they be saved if they don't first hear? And how can they hear if there's no pastor to speak it? 
You ever heard that verse? It's in the Bible, right? How can they get saved if they don't first hear? How can they hear if there's nobody to speak it? Well, how would you get to speak it unless someone told you what to say? So we got to have this life cycle going on here. The lost saved, the saved pastored. We need to get people into the next steps of Christianity to grow in their spiritual walk. And then, of course, commission them, send them out to do this all over again. This is not, this is not the pastor's job to get everybody saved. It's not the pastor's job to get everybody saved. It, it, it's not. We are to go out and bring people in. Right, And I think, I personally think, church at, at large has kind of done a disservice to the kingdom of God where the pastor gets all the treasure stored in heaven for leading people to the Lord. I think a lot of pa pastors just get a high when they see all the hands go up and they're like, yeah, 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 and they take it as if they preached a really good sermon. I don't need to lead another person to the Lord, but you do. You do. You need to practice that. You need to know how to do it. And, and we could create an environment to teach you and show you how to do that. Might be doing something on Sunday. I'm just saying. Check it out. This is called the Great Commission. The Bible talks about the Great Commission, but Family Church has a commission. Family Church has a Great Commission. So we have actually created a language. We've created an in-house language to discuss or to describe our commission. And it's called our vision statement. It goes like this. Family church is reaching the unchurched, sharing the good news of God's love, and building strong families. Reaching the unchurched, sharing the good news of God's love, and building strong families. This is something that if, if anybody ever asks you, like, what is family church about? We're reaching the lost. We're, we're reaching people far from God. How are you doing that? By sharing the good news of God's love. For what reason? To build strong families. This is a, it's an equation, really. And we're not saying that, that you're only welcome here if you're part of a family. No, you're part of this family. And we're building the family of God by doing what the word of God says. All right? So question number one that comes up, I get it all the time. And it, it, never, it never comes across and says like, what are we doing to reach the unchurched? It's, what are you doing, Pastor Mike, to reach the unchurched? What, what are you doing as a church? I mean, and, th and this is how it comes. I'm just being honest with you. You launch a vision statement. Well, we say it. We bring it up on the screen sometimes. Reach the unchurched. What are you doing to reach the unchurched? Well, we're going to describe to you right now what we're doing to reach the unchurched. What we're doing to reach the unchurched. Because I'm part of we. It's not me, it's we. Okay? Here it is, you ready? Here's my answer to that question. And it always confuses people and, and silence is gonna hit here. It hit three services on Sunday when I say it and it's either because you're really processing what I'm saying or you just don't understand what I'm saying at all, right? We provide a passionately energetic weekend worship expression. That's what we do. You do what? We offer a passionately, and you, you cannot say that our worship's not passionately energetic, all right? We offer a passionately energetic weekend worship expression. That's what we're focusing on. We're focusing on the weekend. That's, that's our goal, because up here in the Northeast, most people know, choose to come to church on the weekend. They choose the weekend, okay? So what does this mean? What did, what, what, what did that whole sentence that I just said mean? It means we do church really good. We do church really good. But that's not enough, Pastor Mike. I agree it's not. So what are you going to do about it? What, what are you going to do about it? Because the, the church isn't me. The church isn't me. The church is we. The church isn't me. The church is we. My job, are you ready for this? I'm just gonna throw this out there. My job's not to feed you. My job's to lead you. My job's not to feed you. My job's to lead you. Only babies cry when they're hungry. 
Adults get up and make a sandwich when they're hungry. There's nothing worse than hearing somebody say, well, I had to leave that church because I wasn't being fed. Well, then you're anorexic. Because one meal on a Sunday ain't enough to get you through the whole week. Even if you gorge yourself with the word, 29 scriptures, and you don't remember any of them anyway. Think about it for a second. I need more, I need more church. I need longer church. For what? You're not remembering it. You're not remembering because you were in church longer. Uh, can we be for real for a second? I'm just, be, I'm just going straight out. I'm telling you, this is it right here, man. We do Sunday services really well, really, really, really well. So bring people with you that need Jesus. Bring people with you that need Jesus. Well, my friends, people that I know, they would never step in church. Then you just haven't sold it. You're either ashamed of the product or you're not sure how the product works. But either way, you sell stuff all day long. You sell your favorite hair care product all day long. You sell the latest movie that you just went and saw. You sell it all day long to people. Oh, my God, you got to go watch this movie. And you talk somebody into spending $20 to go watch a movie and you don't even get commission for it. You don't even get stored treasure in heaven for that, right? It's not, it's not me, it's we. We are responsible to see the lost saved, okay? Pastor Mike, I don't understand how doing church is reaching the unchurched. That's the problem with the church today. The church thinks that they're a private country club of Christians, they think, okay, I got saved, now I get to go to a safe haven where dirty people don't touch me now. That's the idea that the Pharisees had. The Pharisees said to Jesus in Matthew 9, or to, to the other disciples in Matthew 9, they said, who is your teacher who he eats with the tax collectors and sinners? To what Jesus responds, hey, healthy people don't go to the doctor. Doctor doesn't get called for healthy people, but he comes for the sick. I came to reach the lost. Don't think you're going to catch me surrounded by a bunch of people who already believe. They got it. They're in heaven. They're going there. They're saved. I came to reach those who don't know me yet. That open seat next to you that's holding your handbag, that's not for your handbag. That's for the person who's not here yet. We don't come to church for me. We come to church for the person who's not here yet. See, if we, can re, if we can refocus that and understand what is the purpose of church, it's to grow the kingdom, not to get fat bellies of the word. Then we should just be a teaching center. Let's just be a Bible school then. Okay. Okay. If we're going to see the law saved, then there have to be people who are sent to go do it. This cycle has to be in operation. If the disciples were going out and bringing in, then we'd be seeing this life cycle happening. If the people in the church who've been Christians for any amount of times were going out into the world and bringing people in, we'd be seeing the life cycle happen. But we lose the momentum of the life cycle when we think church is about me. And you think church is about you. The truth of the matter is we're just not putting time in in our own personal lives to be church. So we go attend church. And attending church doesn't get you to heaven. Being the church does. Okay. What else do we do? We create a welcoming, accepting environment with arms wide open. We create a welcoming, accepting environment with arms wide open. We do church really, really well. And you know what? That's my sweet spot. My sweet spot is not knocking on doors. My sweet spot is not holding a, a, uh, a church service on the streets. That's not 
my sweet spot. In fact, I'm going to go speak at a conference on Saturday. That's not my sweet spot. My sweet spot is getting up here and preparing a really good, high-quality presentation of the gospel in a way that someone says, wait, this was just church? This isn't anything like I ever experienced before. Like, my church is boring. This was actually, like, engaging because that's my sweet spot. That's what family church does really well. But I don't think that's enough. I think we need to be doing more. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You need to be doing what God's called you to do. And if street evangelism is what God called you to do, then you need to do it. Not me. We do. So then you start it. If we need to be doing some sort of uh, coat drive, yes, you do. That doesn't mean I have to organize it. Okay? Just... Paul instructs his spiritual son, Timothy, a spiritual son is someone who has submitted themselves in a fashion to say, hey, I honor you, I respect you, will you mentor me? Will you pour into my life? And Paul stepped in this position with Timothy. He said, yes, I will instruct you, I will teach you, I will show you everything I know, so here's my words to you. And he wrote him two books of the Bible. And in 2 Timothy 4, 5, Paul says to Timothy this, but you, keep your head in all situations. Keep cool, man. Endure hardship. This isn't gonna be easy. This isn't going to be easy. There's going to be attacks. There's going to be temptations. There's going to be slip-ups. There's going to be trials. Doing this thing, building the kingdom of God, is not going to come without a cost. Endure hardship. Ready? And he says this. Do the work of an evangelist. Do you notice what he did not say? He did not say, go out evangelizing. Because Timothy was the pastor of of a church. He's saying that when you do church, it should have an evangelistic flair. You should be looking to see the lost saved in every single one of your messages. You should be looking to have life change every time you present the gospel. Do the work of an evangelist. Ready? And he says this, discharge all duties of your ministry. He said, get other people to do the work. Get other people to do the work. Empower leaders to help move church forward. Find what's in the heart of people. Find what they're called to do. Find what they're good at and empower them to do it. Pastor Mike, we need to be doing more. Yes, you do. How can I help you do more? Because that's what Timothy, that's what Paul is telling Timothy. Yes, we need to be doing more. How can we help you do more? How can we help you do more to advance the kingdom of God? How can we train you? How can we teach you? How can we empower you? How can we equip you to do what God's already put in your heart to do? But so many times when we get, when we get frustrated with ourselves... Because we're not actually doing what we know we're supposed to be doing. We want to point a finger at somebody else and say, well, if you just changed, I would be better at what I'm supposed to do. And God said, no, no. Stir up the gift that's inside of you. Stir up the gift that's inside of you. Now, there may be people who have an evangelistic calling. And they want to hit the streets. And they want to go walk the streets of Middletown. And they want to walk the streets of Goshen. And they want to walk the streets of Monroe. And they want to walk the streets and and talk to people about Jesus Christ. I am all about it. I will give you t-shirts to do it. But I ain't going to be out there doing it. That's not my sweet spot. That's not my sweet spot. I believe that the church needs that. I do, 100%. But that's just not what... Me, I'm called to do, all right? We believe that life change happens in the confines of relationship. We believe that life change happens in the confines of relationship, not cold marketing. Cold marketing, cold calls, none of you like cold calls, right? None of you like that telemarketer that's now calling your cell phone. Oh my God, I feel violated. How'd you get my cell phone number? Right? And when you see that number that you don't recognize on your phone, you kind of, 
Swipe it. You ignore it. I'm not taking this call. I don't know who this is. And now the telemarketers have local cell phone numbers that they call you from. So they're like, oh, it's 845-820. Must be a Middletown number. Hey, you can save 5% of your car insurance. Ah! <laughs> Nobody likes the cold call. And so many times when you confront people that aren't looking for Jesus, they don't normally that quickly have a heart life change. It takes time. It takes relationship. Okay? So we are building a culture of invite and sharing here at Family Church, constantly inviting people to church, constantly sharing the information that's coming through, constantly sharing the messages and the things that, that we're learning to other people. We've got to see the lost Save. The second component is that the saved need to be pastored. And this is probably the most exciting portion of this whole thing for me, is seeing the saved pastored. Because one person cannot pastor 2,500 people. You know what that means? That means somebody got to step their game up. It means somebody got to step up and help a brother out. We need to create opportunities for what Proverbs 27, 17 says. It's one of my favorite verses. We need to create opportunities for this. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron. so My favorite moments, even like last night over at teen camp, I enjoy doing the church thing. I enjoy getting on stage and jumping up and down and spinning around and getting, you know, praying over kids and putting my hands, uh, you know, praying for them and watching God touch their lives. I enjoy that. But the best part for me is like sitting on the front porch of one of the cabins, hanging out with Pastor Wayne, a couple other people, and someone asks a question. What do you think the greatest opportunity afforded the church right now is. And now we have this hour-long conversation. That's what I enjoy the most. That's where I grow the most, where I can glean from someone who's thinking the way I'm thinking, who's dreaming the way I'm dreaming, because iron sharpens iron. When you hang out with too many stones, you're going to get dull. When you're the sharpest Tool in your group, you will quickly get dull. Because you can't give out, give out, give out, give out, and no one give back into you. You will get dull. You will grow weary in well-doing if you do not surround yourself with other people that sharpen you. Okay? Acts 2.42 says this. How did they sharpen? How did they grow? How did the church expand and blossom so much? Are you ready? Here it is. And they devoted themselves to teachings and to social hangouts and to eating, hallelujah, barbecue, and to prayer. They taught, they studied teachings, they hung out in social settings, they ate, and they prayed together. And what happened? Are you ready? And awe came upon every soul. Awe came upon every soul because they were studying together. They were praying together. They were hanging out together. Watch this. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. If you want to see signs and wonders happening in your life, you've got to get together with some people and study the Bible and pray together. we got to have some penny, <laughs> some pork roast. Hallelujah. Santo Jesus. And we have to have some social time. If we don't like each other, we're not going to change the kingdom together. If there's all sorts of dissensions and divisions and backstabbing and gossip, we are not going to advance the kingdom. If we're going to have all those things, guess what? We've become Pharisees. Jesus never said harsh words to sinners. He only used harsh words to people who refuse to admit that they sin. Pharisees. All right. You could chew on that one for a while. 
Our answer to seeing saved people pastored is sermon-based small groups, is the launch of bringing about small groups, special interest groups, serving groups, groups in general, all right? They're not all going to be sermon-based small groups. They're not all going to be serving groups. Some might be completely event-based groups, like maybe somebody's into going to football games. So you get a group of guys, and you, and you, you get tickets to go down to the Giants game every so often, whatever. That becomes your group. Now, when we come to group, every group will have a percentage that is spiritual and a percentage that is social. A percentage that is spiritual and a percentage that is social. And before you start a group, you have to identify what that ratio is. So I just got a, a mountain bike, trying this mountain biking thing out. If, if I came to church and said, hey, I want to start a small group for guys in the church who want a mountain bike. Okay, okay, Pastor Mike, what's the percentage spiritual and what's the percentage social? Because even me, if I start a group, I'm going to identify it. Okay, so mountain biking, it's going to be straight up. 10% spiritual, 90% social. Okay? 10% spiritual. Nine, oh, you know, Pastor Mike, you have a great opportunity. Why don't you do more with the, with the spiritual? Because I ain't that spiritual. I want to go mountain biking. I don't want to have a counseling session. Seriously. Like, that's not the design for this group. Do you know how hard it is sometimes to be a pastor? Somebody invite me to a wedding. And I don't get to enjoy the wedding. Someone grabs me in the corner, hey, I don't want to bother you, but can I just have a few minutes of your time? <laughs> no! Leave me alone. Make an appointment. Let me dance. Let me have some cheap cake that you paid $1,000 for. I'm just kidding. I'm in, I'm in a mood right now. 10% spiritual. What does this look like? Hey, guys, as, we get, as we're getting our bikes off the cars and stuff, come over here. Let's huddle up real quick. Hey, uh, just this weekend, Pastor Mike was talking about, um, you know, seeing the lost saved. And when he said that statement that a baby Christian can get into heaven, but someone who's lost and has never found Jesus cannot, like that hit me like a ton of bricks. We really have a responsibility to go out and talk to people about Jesus. We, need, we should invite some new guys to our bike group and just let them be around Christian guys and, and let the love of Jesus rub off on them. Anyway, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this bike trip that we're protected and safe, that Anthony doesn't fall off his bike and break his ankle today. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Bam, 10%, we're done. Let's go bike. Let's go jump on stuff. Let's go crash and get bloody. Let's do this. But here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. Somewhere along the bike trip, someone's going to say, yo, P. Mike, you ever, you ever just felt dry spiritually? Like you were excited about going to church and being a Christian, and now you just don't? Like I, that's where I'm at. Now that 10% just automatically just happened, organically became 25%. But I'm not designing that. I'm just designing an environment where people can engage, where people can ask questions, where they can be pastored. But we're not just gonna let anybody pastor people. We're not just gonna let anybody pastor people. We're gonna teach you and train you how to be a leader to pastor people. We, 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 we're not putting people in leadership positions that are gonna hurt people. Insecure leaders hurt people. Some of you work for an insecure leader and you've been hurt by them because you come up with an idea and now they feel challenged. You're challenging my authority. You're challenging. No, I just had an idea. <laughs> Insecure leaders hurt people. And we're not going to put people in leadership positions that we can see you're going to hurt somebody. All right? We are going to teach and train and come along people to build leaders that can share the load. Pastoring. But then the pastor need to be discipled. We need to see discipleship happening. Here at Family Church, we offer discipleship classes called Next Level Classes. Next Level 1, Next Level 2, Next Level 3, Next Level 4. We offer these classes where we answer deeper questions. We offer the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our Next Level class. We talk about giving and tithing. Yo, listen, straight, yo, listen, I'm telling you straight up. Listen, 
Listen to what I'm about to say right now. I'm telling you straight up, you are not going to be a leader in this church if you don't believe in giving. It's just not going to happen. Think about it for a second. You don't even believe your own product. You need to find a church that you do believe in that you could sow money into. Like, that's just the straight facts. We, we can't build a church that way. You're going to be a leader, and you're going to talk to people about what the Bible says, but then we don't believe all of it? It just don't work that way. And I'm not trying to be a jerk or anything. We're not taking an offering at the end of service. I'm just telling you straight out what the deal is. We're going to tell you what the Bible is and what our expectations are as leadership in the church. We've got to make this kingdom grow. <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to buy new buildings when we're going to expand and open up other campuses. We need to have it available. Okay? I'm just throwing out there. Just shout. Just say it. Right? We talk about spiritual gifts. What are you spiritually gifted to do? And in that class, we find it. We find what your personality type is. We want to discover that with you. What kind of personality do you have? Uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, some other things, okay? Um, discipleship is a smaller, more intimate journey than what you'll see on a Sunday morning worship expression. People can ask questions. We don't really get to ask questions in this venue, in this setting. In discipleship, we do. We get to meet new people and find a pathway to understand what your commission is. For almost 15 years, I was commissioned to be the youth pastor. Teens were my heartbeat. Seeing the youth have revival and find Jesus and worship God like idiots was my passion. It's what I did. You know, when we moved up to the upstairs over here on the second floor, our worship experiences were so guns and roses ah, that the floor would shake. The doors would rattle down here because, it, because the building was going like this. We literally had to have the engineers come in during a Wednesday night service to watch the building to make sure that we weren't going to make the building break. The ceiling tiles would, down here would bounce so much that the sprinkler heads would disappear in the ceiling. I'm, I am not kidding you, but that's what I was called to do. My vision statement for upstairs was to ignite a passion for the Lord by creating an at-home environment where teens can learn the truth of God's word and begin to influence and impact their community. That's what God had commissioned me to do. Discipleship class is going to help you discover what God has commissioned you to do. And then disciples are sent. The disciples are commissioned. We believe that every person should serve the local church. We believe that every Christian should serve in the local church. We believe that every Christian should serve in the local church, but we are not foolish to think that everybody will. Not everybody will. But I will tell you this. God is calling every believer to serve in the local church. God is calling every believer to serve in the local church. Well, I don't think that God's called me to serve in the local church. It's probably because you swiped the call. Just like the telemarketer. I don't identify that number. Usher. I don't think so. Greeter, not me. Now, you want me to preach, now we can talk about it. You want to make me an elder of the church, then we can talk about it. We can talk about that, God. But you want me to park cars? You want me to change diapers? Swipe. God is calling every believer to serve. Some of you young adults... Older teenagers, young teenagers. He's calling you to serve the local church. We're not to be consumers. We're not just to be simple consumers, consuming and feed me and give me. We're to be prosumers. We're to be users of the word of God. All right? We need greeters. We need welcome team people. We need help in our children's ministry at every single one of our services. God is commissioning you. We need people in our AVL department. We need people in our worship department. We need people in every facet of 
the ministry right now. We are about to hit an exponential growth curve. I'm telling you right now, we are about to hit an exponential growth curve and you are the miracle that's already in the house to fill the position to reach the lost. God's commissioning and calling you. It's not even a question. It's, here's the question, why aren't you obeying? The question is why aren't you obeying? Why are you swiping this call? That, that's the greatest question. God is commissioning you. How does Family Church reach the lost? By our weekend expression. How are we seeing the saved pastor? Through small groups, which you're going to help build. How are we seeing the pastor discipled? Through our next level classes. And how are we seeing the disciples commissioned? Through volunteers in the local church. Now, there's other ways that we are gonna see the disciples sent. There are going to be other ways. But currently, right now, that's the design. If you come and say, Pastor Mike, but I'm feeling that we as a church could be doing more. Yes, you can. How can we help you do more? What is the more that God has placed on your heart? So now you sit down, you make the plan, you make the direction, and figure out how we can train you to prepare you for that. But so many times we get these ideas and we think that someone else needs to be doing it. You're the miracle. You're the miracle that God's called to solve that problem. That's why it's in you. Today, I'm asking, and this is kind of the pitch for this week, setting us up for next week. Search your heart and see what's the greatness that's in you? What's the ministry that's in you? Whose life is going to be changed because of you? Whose life is going to be eternally impact because of you? What class in this church is going to be taught, but you just haven't written it yet? Now, that's a heavy question because it ain't my responsibility to write everything. What class are we not doing yet that's going to be taught, but you just haven't written it yet? because the miracle is in you. We will come alongside you and you will come alongside the Lord and we will make a difference in the kingdom of God. Mm. How can Family Church help you fulfill your calling? We're not, I'm not standing up here to say today, oh well, you know, Family Church needs to do a fundraiser so they can send me on a mission trip. That's not what I'm talking about. That's, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about how can we equip you? How can we train you? How can we instruct you? How can we grow you to prepare you to do? Hey, listen, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. If it's actually God's will and not just a good idea, then he'll, 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 he'll fund it. But how can we equip you? What, what do you need to know? What do you need to learn? What do you need to practice? We want to come alongside you and make that happen. Family church will see the law saved, the saved pastored, the pastor discipled, and the disciple sent. The question is, will you see it too? Will you see this life cycle happen in our church? Will you be part of making this thing turn and watching the kingdom expand all across the Hudson Valley? That we are going to grow what God is planting us all across the Hudson Valley? What part can you play? what miracles in you. Father, we thank you for tonight. We praise you, God, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you did not make us by accident or on accident, but you intentionally crafted us to be who we are going to be in this moment of time. It is not by accident that we are alive in this moment of time. Before the foundation of the earth, you saw us, and you saw this moment, and you saw this time frame, and you chose for us to be alive in this moment for the miracle that you place within us, for the message that you put in us, for the passion that you've placed upon us. So Lord, help us step out. Help us step out of the boat, just like Peter and upon the water. Help us step out into the realm of the unknown, knowing that you are right there with us, that you would never leave us nor forsake us. 
Father, I thank you tonight that this word is planted in our hearts, that it will grow and it will blossom into good fruit. As we leave here today, Lord, tonight, Lord, I pray that we are protected and safe. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Love you guys.